Talent Matters. And today we're with George Randall to tell you more about it. George Randall is a strategic advisor to EF Overwatch, former U.S. Army officer and vice president of global talent acquisition at Forcepoint, a human-centric cybersecurity company. George is also the co-author of Talent War. I highly recommend. It's a great read. Uh, we're going to get into some of it. Hey, it's good uh, to be here. Thanks for having me on, guys. Very well, much thanks, appreciate it. Thanks for being here to talk about how HR is doing it wrong. Yeah, lots to talk about. <laughs> lots to talk about in that regard. So why don't we start with a little bit more about who you are? Uh, so, yeah, any a little bit more about me. Um, yeah, strong masochistic gene in my body to be in talent acquisition for 20 plus years. Yeah. I, you know, I enlisted in the Army to pay my way through school. Had a colorful vocabulary, we'll say. <laughs> and uh, somebody said, you know, hey, Randall, if you're so smart, why don't you go be an officer? So I shrugged my shoulders, did it, uh, kind of won the lottery. At the time, you know, for those historians out there, I went to Berlin in 1989. Oh, uh, you know, the walls there, yeah, uh, yeah. retired ally Checkpoint Charlie, you know, did a bunch of deployments, one to Kenya, Somalia, mm. a lot of leadership positions. But then after the leadership ended, I was like, well, the skills that I learned in the military, should make me successful in the civilian world so didn't know what i didn't know and jumped out and had a veteran firm place me and that was my first experience to how hard and how bad talent acquisition could be i did well in the job they gave me got promoted some stock options made some money but just a horrible fit man horrible yeah. fit <laughs> it's like a gut punch i'm like really i just walked out of a great career in the army to go do this okay and then somebody looked at me and said hey you know you've got some leadership skills i said well you think <laughs> You know, I'd like 200 people in the army and it just snowballed from there. And the weird part was that there was like this mental connection in my head that was like, you know, I loved building teams in the army and I saw the value of what good teams could do. Mm. And I had been on the business side and I was like, you know, God, recruiting was like pulling teeth. I'm like, well, mm. I could do this better. And bam, it just took off from there. Mm. Acceptance of what is, mm. is such a. Yeah, hard thing for me I, in this human experience. Yeah. I think probably for others, but I that feel is, that um, sentiment around the dating life. <laughs> <laughs> so true. You know, if you're looking at a brand name, or, or if you're dating, you know, you yeah, get in that point totally. where you're you're so hopeful, or you want this to be, or alternatively, you bring biases, or you bring something to a situation, and you're not seeing it for just what it is. And and it's helpful if that's where you start. Uh, you know, we do a webinar every week, and and part of EF Overwatch is, you know, I help prepare veterans to make that cross and, and mm -hmm. to articulate. And, you know, I have this phrase, which they generally laugh about. And you guys know this. Have you ever gone to the grocery store hungry without a list? No, it's oh, awful. yeah, it's a, it's a bad it's a idea. Terrible experience. What do you come back with? Everything. You know? I have three Junk packages food. of double stuffed Oreos and, and <laughs> you know, and my wife's like, seriously, dude, if you go with a list and a purpose and you know what success looks like or what good looks like, you know how to get there. It's or yeah. it's much easier to get there. Mm. It's not that experience doesn't matter. The challenge is, is that everybody's over rotating on it and prior experience or performance at another company is not necessarily predictive of success in your environment. How do you identify a quality practitioner to access and select talent? Well, I think there are those people, you know, if I'm building my own team, I'm looking for people who are curious about the human condition. Somebody who's curious, that likes customer service, that wants to solve business problems through talent, um, curious about the human condition and, and can build relationships with people. The rest of it, I can take it from there. And, and some of those people that are that are really, really social, that have kind of that mindset or a little bit of a business acumen, those are the people that you can make great talent consultants. You know, that's interesting. Like the, what you just said about teams, Keith and I had this experience in uh, in college, intramural flag, like we want to be, you know, we're weekend warriors. Uh, I am too. I still am, even in my old age. Playing with like this super talented team. We're like, there's no way we should lose. Like at every position, we're like, we're stacked. And we get out there the first year and we suck. In between seasons, Keith and I got together and we're like, yo, okay, we're going to put people in positions and we're going to coach. And we came up with the route trees. We came up with the with a plan. We set a plan. We put everybody in positions and we came back and went undefeated, won the championship. And we realized that it's like, well, first of all, it was kind of surprising because it was a whole bunch of alphas. And we we're like, are they going to listen to us? And oh, it's like, yeah, tough. yeah, yeah. Right away. There was no question. We said, you're the best at this. Do this. 
stop trying to be quarterback when you're the best receiver on like 17 fields. Go play receiver. And people responded and they reacted and we went and won games and it was fun. Yeah, I've, I've tried to do that with the talent acquisition teams I build is that, you know, when you, when you explain to people that you're really, really good at doing this and you get those people in a place and let them know that the team wins versus individuals and they're an expert at that piece and you need them to, you know, it's not just a blocking and tackling like, you know, I mean, do your position the best of your ability and show why you're a pro or near pro. It's amazing what people could do together. Amazing. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So how do companies ultimately pivot from the Keynesian approach of products, profits, and services over their people to people as their priority? It's a two-part answer. Number one, it's, it's your senior executives, your C-suite. Number one, recognizing that the number one or the only true competitive advantage that they're going to hold in this rapidly changing economy and changing products, you know, IT, I mean, just is that that only true competitive advantage is your people. So if they get that mindset right, and then you get the strategic HR or HR that realizes they're, they're not just compliance, they're not just operational, they're not just payroll, they're not just comp and benefits, that they are the gateway to what feeds all of your other profit centers. Your, your product, your service, your sales, all of it all comes through HR. And so the way that it switches is that you have executives that go, you know what? We are nothing without our people. That's mm -hmm. where it starts. It's an attitude. We call it in the book. It's, it's just a mindset. How much of the current state is painted by your experience versus like the military component of recruiting? To back up just a little bit, it was just yeah. this weird synergistic moment when Mike, and he won't admit it, but I think it was like Real Housewives of Beverly Hills that he's watching <laughs> with his wife, and he gets this idea. He's like, man, you know, George has got all this. I've got all this. He's advising yeah. us. we got to write a book. So my time in the military, admittedly, was pre-Global War on Terror. So the real sele selection and assessment and the stuff that we bring in the book is, is really Mike because he spent so much time in it. So to answer your question, mine was really the experience of getting into recruiting. You know, there's staffing, there's recruiting, there's talent acquisition if you really want to nerd out on it. And we do. It, it was blindingly horrible. And, and there's going to be a lot of listeners who aren't going to like this, but... The more marquee your company is, usually the worse it's a, your it's, practice it's a catastrophe. Up. Yeah, totally. Because they're overly reliant on that brand. I've been interviewed and and offered some roles at some of the some really really top companies, and and, and I turned them down not for any other reason than it just didn't fit what I wanted to do. But yeah, it's all been experience where I've seen the great and I've seen the not so great. And I've seen the, oh my God, how is this even working? How'd you get to a place to be okay with that? One, knowing it's a good fit and two, saying no. You know, when, when you're in the recruiting talent acquisition space, yeah, you know, you know, what's going to be a grind with a purpose and you know, what's going to be a grind where you're you're just waiting for the next report or the next fire drill for you to just grind your teeth on that's not going to be enjoyable um and so you know my wife taught me a phrase a long long time ago that i really appreciated um and i wish i would have applied it in my dating life to be quite honest with you which is see things for what they are not mm -hmm. for what you want them to be mm -hmm. And so later on in my career, I kind of learned to do that, like to ask the right questions because, you know, you can have right job, wrong person. You know, you can have any combination of that. And it really has to be a win for both sides for you. Like you guys said, for the team, you know, if you've got the right people and you put them in the right positions, great things happen. And so I, I just, you know, have been you know, fortunate to to get some really, really good experiences um, and then kind of turn down some things that, that might have been catastrophically horrible for me. In case you didn't know, we have another podcast and it's called More in Common. We interview the likes of Kristen Bell, Katherine Hahn, Dr. Donald Grant, Dolly Chug, and many, many more. People that we met at the airport, neighbors, friends. It is an amazing social experiment, if you will, to explore the fact that we have more in common than that which divides us and to demonstrate compassion and action through conversation. Join us if you dare. When it comes to your principles around what 
good hiring, staffing, what good talent acquisition, uh, what good HR looks like. What happens when you're in a scenario that challenges those principles, and how do you how do you evaluate that? Well, you know, I try to get in or try to build teams or try to build processes that all start with relationships. And, and it's one of the things we talked about in the book that the, the best talent acquisition teams, the best talent scouts are embedded in the business. They understand that business and you have good relationships. And usually if you have those good relationships and my senior recruiters know their P&L, know their hotspots, know, you know, the project mm-hmm. delivery timelines, know all of those things. And they even know the succession planning or where they have talent gaps. So you don't run into the conflict of principles, but I've been in plenty of companies where it's just like they're screaming at you to get a butt in the seat. For me, it's it's still my name attached to it. So mm. I don't want to be slinging something against the wall. So I tell my recruiters, look, if I got to take the heat for you because you know they're trying to hire somebody bad, fine, then let me take the heat. If I am a business that mm-hmm. leverages my existing team mm-hmm. to be a part of the selection process, how do I put the right team members? Like, how do I identify or develop those team members to be effective talent selecting individuals when it's not their primary job? So first thing that that Mike and I talk about is A players select A players. Mm-hmm. Or those A players are, are your humble, confident top performers. That's the first place that you start. Who is going to select somebody that's going to help their team win and and then from there your talent acquisition your hr team need to figure out a process um a success profile for the roles that you're hiring and then train them how to identify or solicit answers that help you determine if they have that characteristic i mean anybody could screen for the experience part that's not that's not the hard part it's the behavioral interviewing But you should get good at that because additionally, let's say we take an A player from an engineering team and you teach them how to do behavioral interviewing. Those same skills go towards their leadership, coaching, and mentoring of other people on their team. So it's not like it's a whole new skill set. You know, being able to identify great characteristics in another also helps you mentor and coach and develop the people that are on your team. So it's, it's a skill that you can teach. Uh, it's a skill that you can practice, but it starts with selecting A players who will, who will help you identify other A players. Mm-hmm. See if I understand that correctly. It's not a wasted skill to teach them. It's not just no. going toward talent acquisition. It is also going to make them a better team player. And it's going to make them a better leader on a team. It has multiple uses. So it's it's a mindset. It's the mindset shift from the organization yeah. saying we need you all to understand how to. You're not just talent. a body in the seat to ask a couple of questions. Yeah, exactly. Say, hey, are you the culture fit here? Yeah, it, it, exactly. And if you take your 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 top salesperson, they are not going to lower their standards to bring in a substandard salesperson that's not going to help them achieve the team goal. If you're a programmer, service provider, a, a technical assistance manager, a customer, you're not going to bring somebody in that's going to bring your team down if you're an A player. Additionally, those skills that you teach them as that person moves up in their career it makes them better and better and better at selecting people for their own teams. So I think it's a great investment of time. 35 of 250 SEAL applicants make it. Mm -hmm. Is there a ratio that organizations should be looking at uh, for for their applications to new hires? Uh, My answer is no. And I have people ask, ask me a similar question, which is how many interviews or how many interviewers is enough? What's the magic number? Uh, there isn't one. Uh, the point is, is that do you have a process that enables you to identify those success attributes in an interview? And if your talent consultants are really good, maybe it takes them putting three people in front of you for you to get that next day player. If your talent acquisition team has to funnel 200 people past you to, for you to get one or two, my strong suspicion is they don't know what the hell they're looking for. Mm. Um, and so if you have your talent acquisition consultants embedded in the business as a hiring manager, it's such a great use of your time that when you know that the two or three people you're going to see, you're going to have a hard time picking amongst those three, then you're doing things right. One of the most common challenges I hear is I don't have time for acquiring talent or building a bench. How did you get there? 
or how do you recommend others get there? And I make it really, really simple. And sometimes I'm a little bit too blunt, but I'm like, did you ever think that the reason that you don't have time is because you don't have the right people? Mm. Mic drop. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> I mean, yeah, I get a lot of twisted expressions after I do that one. Yeah. But if you, if, if you really, really think about it, if you're a leader, your, your time should be spent on anticipating things or planning to make the things that you need to do in the future successful in the strategic view. And if you don't have time for the here and now and the hiring, it's one of the indicators that you don't have the right people on your team. When evaluating talent, does passion matter? I think it does, as long as it's coupled with authenticity. Um, because you'll get a lot of people that will blow smoke up your skirt and in an interview, you know, they're absolutely going to come full tilt and stuff like that. But yeah, I think it does because that passion is, is an outward sign of curiosity. It's an outward sign of, um, learning agility that, that they're, that passion is going to drive them to learn more about that role, about that function, about the things that go into that. And so, yeah, I do think passion matters. And, and, and given you have people that are just interviewing for a job and you get somebody comes in and goes, hey, I really like what you guys do. And, and these are two things that I really, really like. And, uh, you know, I'd like to drive that further. Hey, that's a great start with me. I'm confident that Keith and I were going to ask the exact same question because we <laughs> we are we've been friends for 18 years and yeah, we, we twin brain. And he literally just asked the question yeah. that I was getting ready to ask yeah. you. So here, we'll ask it again. <laughs> How do you assess authenticity? Uh, I don't think that there's a true assessment for authenticity, but, you know, being in the talent acquisition function, I think most people generally have a good compass for when something isn't right. It's two, three, five degrees off due north. And and when you sense that, then you need to dig in. But, you know, to be honest, the way that I do it in interviews is I don't ask them typical interviewing questions where they have to think. Mm. And if I can get a, a candidate thinking, I watch their brain, I watch their eyes, I watch all that happen. And you know whatever they deliver, if you catch them in the moment, 99.9% .9 of the candidates don't have the ability to be inauthentic in that snap moment. I try to create the conditions, and when I teach the recruiters, that's what we're looking for. Um, but you know, generally, I don't find a lack of authenticity as a problem in interviewing. Um, you, you tend to see the people that, that just are trying to win the job, tell you what you want to hear and an answer. And, you know, as I teach some of the veterans, one of, the, one of my favorite phrases, and I tell you guys, it's like, you know, if you have kids or if you're married, you know, the longer you talk, like my wife asked me a question, that better be a short, direct answer. Because the longer I talk, the more guilty she knows I am. And that kind of applies to the interviewing process as well. We're going to take a pause from today's conversation with George. We'll break this up into two parts. We're going to bring you the next one in a couple of days. So keep an eye out. I hope you've enjoyed this last half hour and we'll be back with you soon.